right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, before I get to our introduction, just to go over a few of our usual housekeeping notes that we are live on YouTube right now. The recording will be available to watch anytime after this. Uh, we will have both Spanish and English captions as well as a transcript available. Um, we encourage you to ask questions or comment. Just remember to be logged into your YouTube account in order to do that. Um, and with today's session, we you can ask questions whenever you have them, but we will get to those at the end of the session. Um, and as always, we love to know more about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know a little about yourself. So today I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Ross Green, who is the originator of the innovative evidence-based model of intervention called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. He also developed and executive produced the award-winning documentary film, The Kids We Lose, which was released in 2018. Dr. Green served on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for over 20 years and is now founding director of the nonprofit Lives in the Balance, which aims to disseminate the CPS model and support caregivers through a vast array of free web-based resources, advocate on behalf of kids with concerning behaviors and their caregivers, and advocate for systemic changes to encourage the use of non-punitive, non-exclusionary interventions. He's currently adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology at Virginia Tech and adjunct professor in the Faculty of Science at University of Technology, Sydney in Australia. Dr. Green's research has been funded by the Stanley Research Institute, the National Institutes of Mental Health, the US Department of Education and the Maine Juvenile Justice Advisory Group. He lectures and consults extensively to families, general and special education schools, inpatient psychiatry, psychiatry units, and residential and juvenile detention facilities throughout the world. Um, welcome, Dr. Green. Thanks, Jen, and thanks to NJ Ace for um, inviting me to do this. Thank you. Um, before you get going, I just wanted to say that your model is so good, and it truly gets the root of what kids and adults need. And I know that this is something you've talked about a lot, and I'm sure you'll cover to an extent, but you've said that many teachers end up leaving the field in the first few years because of the difficulty of managing, you know, concerning behaviors and the rates of restraint and seclusion are very high. And so I just really want to stress to everyone listening today that it doesn't have to be that way. And not just in schools, but in therapeutic environments, the problem is the model that we've been using. And Ross, Dr. Green has such a respectful, holistic approach to solving problems and helping kids. And so I just really wanna thank everyone for being here with us. Um, and then the last thing I wanna leave everyone to kind of sit with uh, while Dr. Green is presenting. It's a quote by Anna Williams. Um, this was part of an article that they wrote and um, it says this, the locus of pathology exists not in the autistic person and I'll preface this by saying this applies to all people, but especially people with disabilities in this case. Um, okay, so let me start over. The locus of pathology exists not in the autistic person, but in the interaction between a hostile environment and the subjugated autistic. It is essential for parents, practitioners, educators, and autistic people themselves to ask the crucial question, is the autistic a machine or an organism? Are we active agents in our own embodied experience or are we a locus of behavior? It is not with defiance, but autonomy that I declare as an autistic person, I am not a manifestation of stimuli and response. I am angential, I am autonom autonomously autistic. So with that, Dr. Green, I will hand it over to you and Thank then you. I'll be back for the Q&A. Fabulous. Uh, and um, the Q&A will be about in an hour and 10 minutes, just for those of you who are watching live. Um, what you're going to be hearing about from me for about the next hour and 10 minutes is this model of care that I originated called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. And yes, as the title says, it's how we move from approaches primarily focused on power and control to an approach that is primarily focused on collaboration and problem solving. Now, why, why would we wanna do that? Because power and control isn't working out very well for, in my opinion, the vast majority of kids to whom power and control approaches 
are being applied. Um, they are the kids we lose. They are um, not doing well. And we need to change gears for those kids and figure out what they actually do need and um, move from power and control to collaboration and problem solving. Now, this is an intro. Um, wanna, you wanna make note of that website down at the bot left, lower left of the screen, livesinthebalance.org. That is the website of Lives in the Balance, the nonprofit that I founded. And uh, what you will find on that website is all kinds of free resources to take you beyond what you're hearing about today. And I will be referring to that website uh, fairly often because there are gonna be some things that I'm covering that you're gonna be able to find on the Lives in the Balance website. So here we go. To move from power and control to collaboration and problem solving, to help kids better than we're helping them now. There are five paradigm shifts that are involved. Um, this is the most important thing I cover no matter how long a presentation is, the rest is details. Um, but this I've got to cover because um, the details you can pick up in books and on the website, but the paradigm shifts, the way of thinking of this model is the most important part. Here's paradigm shifting component number one. A lot of us folks who were trained to work with kids with concerning behaviors, were trained to focus primarily on the kids concerning behavior. And we were trained in strategies aimed at modifying those behaviors. That's not what you're doing in this model. Yes, I was trained that way, but I haven't uh, used those strategies in a very long time and not because I'm allergic to them, but primarily because they don't make a great deal of sense to me anymore. Um, in this model, you are instead focused on the problems that are causing those behaviors and solving them. This is a problem solving model, not a behavior modification model. Now, the minute I say that, a very important question springs up for many people. If we're not busy modifying the kid's behavior, how will the kid's behavior improve? Well, what the accumulated research tells us is that if you are busy solving problems in the ways that I'm about to describe, the kid's behavior improves every bit as much as it would have if all we were busy doing is modifying the behavior. But if all we're busy doing is modifying the behavior, problems that are causing those behaviors don't get solved. This is a problem solving model. In this model, your role is problem solver. Now you might be wondering, what kind of problems is he talking about here? Well, at home, this might be problems like difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night, a problem causing concerning behaviors in households across North America every night difficulty uh, completing XYZ homework assignment, difficulty eating what mom has made for dinner, difficulty getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner. I could go on forever. Those are examples of problems that are causing concerning behaviors. Now at school, what might some of those problems be? Um, difficulty completing the double digit division problems on the worksheet in math, difficulty coming back into the classroom after recess, difficulty keeping hands to self in the hallway between classes, difficulty agreeing with Billy on the rules of the four square game during recess, all problems causing concerning behaviors. Once those problems are solved, they don't cause concerning behaviors anymore. Of course, for them to get solved, we have to identify them which means that we have to stop focusing so much on the behavior that's being caused by those problems and focus instead on the problems themselves. Now, in this model, what is behavior? Simply the means by which the kid is communicating that there's an expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. That's what behavior is. That's what concerning behavior is doesn't really matter what the concerning behavior is, it's communicating that the kid is having difficulty meeting a particular expectation. We, we've all heard the expression, behavior is communication. Now you know what the behavior is communicating. I'm stuck. There's an expectation, I'm having difficulty meeting. 
Now, researchers and behavioral scientists have been trying to slice the pie of concerning behaviors for a very long time. Um, you could slice the pie of concerning behaviors into diagnoses, but um, I, I don't find psychiatric diagnoses to be especially useful for helping us understand why the kid is exhibiting concerning behaviors. Truth is, if you look at the diagnostic criteria for a particular psychiatric diagnosis, what you're going to find is a long list of concerning behaviors. So when you're talking about diagnosis, you're still talking about behavior. Uh, scientists have sliced the pie of concerning behavior into internalizing and externalizing. That's fine. Uh, people who wear trauma lenses often split the world into fight versus flight. That's fine. I slice the pie of concerning behaviors into two categories, and they're actually pretty artificial, except for one very important point, lucky and unlucky. What are lucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations? I'm not gonna be exhaustive here, but here's a sampling. Uh, whining, pouting, sulking, with, oops, withdrawing, crying. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations lucky? Those ways aren't going to get you popped into timeout, not going to get you held in from recess, not going to get you held after school, not going to get you a detention, suspension, expulsion, not going to get you hit. Still very popular in American households and American public schools in 19 different states not going to get you pinned to the ground by two to four big adults, what's known as a restraint, not going to get you thrown into a locked or blocked padded room, what's known as a seclusion, not going to get you arrested. But best of all, those lucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations are highly likely to elicit empathy, nurturance, support from your caregivers. That's a lucky kid. Not so for the unlucky variety. And now we have stumbled across the main reason that I use lucky and unlucky because of how we treat them. What are unlucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations? You already know, but here's another sampling. Screaming, swearing, hitting, spitting, kicking, biting, throwing, destroying, running. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations unlucky? At the mild end, those ways are going to get you popped into timeout, uh, held in from recess, it's held after school. Now we're getting a little more serious. Detention, suspension, expulsion, hit, pinned, thrown, arrested. Um, that's an unlucky kid. Um, even though the field of developmental psychopathology has been telling us for a very long time that whether you are lucky or unlucky, whether you are communicating, that you are having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are lucky or unlucky, your behavior is communicating the exact same thing, I'm stuck. There are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. But if you are communicating that you're having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are unlucky, you are far less likely to be handled with empathy, nurturance, and support. There are kids on the autism spectrum who communicate that they're having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are lucky. There are kids on the autism spectrum who are communicating that they're having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are unlucky. Just remember this, whether the behavior is unlucky or lucky, a signal is a signal is a signal. Signals communicate the exact same thing. Now, I get it. Some signals are more scary, more dangerous, more upsetting, more concerning than others. But a signal is a signal is a signal in terms of what it's communicating. Now, you might be wondering, why have we been so focused on behavior for so long? 
Because a very long time ago, B.F. Skinner told us that behavior, overt behavior, is the only thing that's objective, the only thing that's observable, the only thing that's quantifiable. And B.F. Skinner did say that. But B.F. Skinner also talked every bit as much about the conditions in which those concerning behaviors occur, which, by the way, are just as objective, just as observable, just as quantifiable. In this model, you are focused on those conditions. You are not focused on the concerning behaviors that are occurring in those conditions. Now, we don't call them conditions in this model. We're not allergic to the term, just not what we call them. Um, we don't call them antecedents in this model. That's a synonym, but not what we call them. In the CPS model, we refer to what B.F. Skinner called conditions as either unmet expectations, when do all human beings look bad? When there's an expectation, they're having difficulty meeting. So unmet expectations is a great synonym for what B.F. Skinner referred to as conditions or what some people refer to as antecedents, but the preferred term is unsolved problems, also known as problems that have yet to be solved, also known as problems that are waiting to be solved. Unsolved problems is what I'll be calling them from this point forward. Now, as you might imagine, focusing on the problems that are causing behaviors instead of the behaviors that are being caused by those problems is going to require in most schools and facilities and sometimes mental health clinics different assessment methodology because you know what still these days primarily gets assessed when a kid has concerning behaviors the kids concerning behaviors we do behavior checklists we do behavior observations in schools we do a functional behavior assessment all so that we can come up with something known as a behavior plan all focused on the signal all focused on the fever all simply focused on the means by which the kid is communicating that there are expectations the kid is having difficulty meeting but not focused on the expectations themselves in this model you're focused on those expectations themselves we use an assessment tool in this model called the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems to give us the information that's been missing about this kid there's paradigm shifting component number one. As you can tell, that's a biggie. Here's paradigm shifting component number two. It's not going to take quite as long. Now that we are in the problem solving business, we got to think about what kind of problem solvers we want to be. We adults tend to be real keen on problem solving of the unilateral kind. That's where the adult decides what the solution is and imposes it on the kid. It's also not what you're doing in this model. In this model, we operate on a very important assumption. You want to solve a problem with a kid, any kid, but especially one with concerning behaviors, you're going to need a teammate. You're going to need a partner. Who's your partner? The kid. And by the way, generally speaking, the kid is going to be delighted to help you out. The kid has been wondering for a very long time, how come we adults keep trying to make things better? without the kid's input, without the kid's involvement, without the kid's ideas, without the kid's sign-off. This is problem solving of the collaborative kind. It's something you're doing with the kid, not to the kid. Now, the minute I say that, some other questions tend to pop up, like, what if the kid won't talk? What do we do? We solve problems collaboratively all the time with reluctant talkers. We find that reluctant talkers will talk if we're not talking them about, with them about their concerning behavior, but rather talking with them about what's making it hard for them to meet certain expectations. What about non-speaking kids? Non-speaking kids can participate in solving the problems that affect their lives. I'm always telling people, don't sell those non-speaking kids 
short, they are communicating. They're just communicating in ways that are not our preferred modality, the spoken word, but you can involve non-speaking kids in solving the problems that affect their lives through any variety of technologies that are readily available these days. This is solving problems collaboratively, not unilaterally. That's a very big shift. Big shift number three. Um, as you all know, a great deal of the intervention that takes place for kids with concerning behaviors takes place in the heat of the moment, emergently, reactively, late, after a concerning behavior has already occurred, which occurs well after the unsolved problem that set the concerning behavior in motion in the first place. You're late, that's reactive. 99.9% .9 of what you're doing in this model is planned, proactive. Uh, as you might imagine, some questions pop up on that theme as well, like, how can we be planned and proactive when we never know when the kid's going to get upset? When we never know when the kid's going to struggle, when the kid is so unpredictable. Here are the answers. Kid is not unpredictable. You know exactly when the kid is going to struggle or become upset if you answer two questions right up front. And those two questions are why and when, as in, why do some kids respond so poorly to problems and frustrations? When is this kid responding? Why is this kid responding so poorly to problems and frustrations? When do kids exhibit concerning behaviors? When is this kid exhibiting concerning behaviors? All right, let's start answering some questions. Why do some kids respond so poorly to problems and frustrations? We are going to rely for the answer to that question on the research that has accumulated over the last 40 to 50 years on kids with concerning behaviors. And if you can imagine that research can be summarized in one sentence, and here it is. Why do some kids respond so poorly to problems and frustrations? Because they're lacking the skills to respond more adaptively. Keyword, skills, missing word, motivation. There isn't a shred of research, not one study, telling us that kids respond poorly to problems and frustrations because of poor motivation, which begs the question, then why have we been spending so much time giving kids the incentive, the motivation to respond well to problems and frustrations? I don't have a great answer to that question. Maybe because we weren't sure what else to do. Um, thank goodness. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is going to help us identify this kid's lagging skills. And once we've identified the kid's lagging skills, we will have the right lenses on lagging skills, not lagging motivation. And that is a much more compassionate, much more accurate, much more productive set of lenses. W when do kids exhibit concerning behavior? Just like the rest of us, when there are expectations they're having difficulty meeting, when there are unsolved problems. Thank goodness. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is going to help us figure out what this kid's unsolved problems are, and then we'll know what we're working on with this kid and what we could have been working on for a very long time if we weren't so focused on the kid's concerning behavior and modifying it. As I frequently say, concerning uh, lagging skills and unsolved problems are is the information that's been missing. Um, once we have the information that's been missing, this kid is very predictable and intervention can be almost exclusively 
proactive, as driven home by this slide. Uh, this slide depicts what I call the sequence of restraint and seclusion, but it's not only the sequence of restraint and seclusion, it is the sequence of all punitive exclusionary disciplinary practices. There are five bubbles on the screen. The colors are meaningful. In blue, everything that's early, crisis prevention. In red, everything that's late, crisis management. You don't want to be late. You want to be early. What's early? The only blue bubble on the screen. Figuring out what expectations the kid is having difficulty meeting. What are this kid's unsolved problems? And solving those problems proactively so that we never find ourselves in the red. That's early. And if that's what was mostly being done in families and schools and treatment facilities, there would be no need for restraint, seclusion, or any other punitive exclusionary disciplinary practices. The problem, of course, is that that is not what's going on in too many places. What is going on in too many places? What is the prototypical adult response when a kid is having difficulty meeting a particular expectation? Red bubble number one, insist harder, push harder. Founded, I guess, on the belief that pushing kids harder to meet expectations we already know they cannot reliably meet elicits better performance, except that that has not been my observation. It has not been my observation that pushing kids harder to meet expectations we already know the kid cannot reliably meet elicits better performance. No, in my observation, what does pushing kids harder to perform expectations that we already know they can't reliably perform? What does that elicit? Red bubble number two concerning behavior that communicates to us something we already knew. Uh, I can't meet that expectation. I want you to notice something very important here. The behavior is late. The behavior is late. The unsolved problem that's causing the behavior already happened. Interventions that are focused on behavior are interventions that are focused on what's late. Now, if the behavior is of a certain type, the unlucky type, we adults on the basis of our crisis prevention training are going to conclude that the kid is becoming escalated. And what are we going to do next because of our crisis prevention training? We are going to try to de-escalate the kid, but how can that be crisis prevention? I know it's called crisis prevention, and a lot of folks were trained in it, thinking that it was crisis prevention, but you are now very late. If you're very late, it's crisis management. If our de-escalation efforts fail, and often they do because you're late, what do you do next? The other thing your crisis prevention, but really crisis management training taught you to do, uh, restrain or seclude the kid. You are now very, very late. That cannot possibly be crisis prevention. By the way, restrain or seclude the kid based on the belief that that will keep the kid, other kids, and you safer. I am aware and I've looked of no study, none, telling us that restraining and secluding kids keeps us and the kids safer. In fact, the data suggests to me that the reality is in the exact opposite direction. This is a very important graphic for helping us understand what's early and what's late. In this model, 99.9% .9 of what you're doing is early, proactive. Paradigm shifting component number four is the mentality of the model. Kids do well if they can. Uh, why is kids do well if they can earth shattering? 
because of what we've been believing for most of human evolution about kids. Kids do all if they wanna. Kids do all if they can and kids do all if they wanna are two completely different mentalities. With kids do all if you, they can, you're thinking if the kid could do well, they would do well. If the kid isn't doing well, something must be getting in the kid's way. What's getting in the kid's way? What the research tells us is getting in the kid's way, lagging skills, unsolved problems. With kids do well if they wanna, you're thinking the reason the kid isn't doing well is because the kid doesn't wanna do well. Why would the kid not wanna do well? A very important question for us caregivers to be asking ourselves, why on earth would the kid not wanna do well? Well, a very popular explanation for why the kid wouldn't want to do well is because it's working out better for the kid to do poorly. The kid has the skills to do just fine, but doing poorly is working out better for the kid than doing well would, which makes no sense whatsoever, except that there are some very popular characterizations of kids with concerning behaviors that flow from the belief that somehow doing poorly is working out better for the kid than doing well would. Characterizations like attention seeking, manipulative, coercive, unmotivated, limit testing, none of them are true. Well, I don't have time for me to cover all of them, but let me put to bed a few of them. The kid is seeking attention by doing poorly. You mean the kid has the skills to seek attention the right way, but is choosing to seek attention the wrong way because that's making the kid's life go better? I've never seen it. I'm about 2,000 kids with concerning behaviors in at this point in my career. A bunch of them were in prison. I have yet, I'm open to it, but I've yet to come across one that had the skills to seek attention the right way and it was choosing to seek attention the wrong way because that way is making the kid's life go better. Plus, if you think a kid is seeking attention through their concerning behavior, what very popular intervention is going to make a great deal of sense? Ignore the kid. So as to pull all of the reinforcement out of the kid's concerning behavior. But what if that's wrong? What if the kid's concerning behavior isn't for the purpose of seeking attention, but is instead simply communicating that there's an expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting? You can't ignore that. Let's jump down, just in the interest of time, to unmotivated. I would never use that characterization to describe anybody. Why not? Because here's what I've learned. The minute we take a much closer look, what are this kid's lagging skills? What are this kid's unsolved problems? We find that unmotivated doesn't even come close to capturing what's really going on with this kid. The trick, of course, is to take a closer look using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. By the way, if you're thinking he must have a financial stake in that instrument, uh, that would be incorrect. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is available on the Lives in the Balance website, free, along with a 35 minute video to teach you how to use it, along with a video of it actually being used in a school, all free, just like all of the other resources on the Lives in the Balance website. Why is kids do all if they can so important? Because if you think a kid isn't doing well because the kid doesn't want to do well, then you are going to be pointed toward interventions that are aimed at making the kid want to do well. Basically, the technology here is pretty straightforward. Reward the signals you like so as to see more of them. Teach and reteach those signals. Punish the signals you don't like so as to see less of them. And you are now in the business of making a kid want to do well founded on the belief that the kid didn't want it in the first place. 
if, by the way, those practices are founded on any beliefs whatsoever. I and my colleagues at Lives in the Balance work with a lot of schools, a lot of facilities, a lot of parents. Whenever we ask them, why are you still doing what you're telling us isn't working? The number one response is, well, because it's the way we've always done it. Here's my attitude. If the way we've always done it hadn't been working for the kids we've always done it to, we probably ought to stop doing it and think of something better to do. In every school, it's the same 10, 20, 30 kids who are accounting for 70 to 80% of the discipline referrals in that school and everything else that's happening after those disciplinary referrals. Proof, by the way, that those disciplinary referrals aren't working. If those disciplinary referrals were working, those numbers wouldn't be what they are. We're losing a lot of kids. Let there be no doubt. The concerning behaviors of these kids can sometimes be scary, can sometimes be disruptive, can be very concerning. But the rest of it is how we are going about trying to help them. We are losing kids because of the ways in which we are trying to help them. I call them the kids we lose. And that's why the documentary film produced by Lives in the Balance came out in 2018 is called The Kids We Lose. If you haven't seen it, it is streaming on the Lives in the Balance website in the advocacy section of the website so you can watch it. But let me give you forewarning, it's brutal because it is a very realistic depiction of what we're still doing to kids here in the year 2021. Kids do all if they can is a big deal. It's a very important mentality especially considering the alternative and where the alternative leads us. Paradigm shifting component number five, and then we're done with the paradigm shifting components. Doing well is preferable. Now for me, that's a statement of the obvious. Of course, doing well is preferable. A preference for doing well is why most of us do well most of the time. We prefer it. And we have the skills to pull it off. Um, the difference between a well-behaved kid and a kid with concerning behaviors is not that the well-behaved kid prefers doing well and the kid with concerning behaviors doesn't. That is incorrect. It's that the kid who's well-behaved has skills that the kid with concerning behaviors is lacking. Skills like flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, emotion regulation, those kind of skills. The variants of those skills are listed on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. But picture this, you've got two kids sitting at a table struggling with the exact same math task. Perhaps both of them are lacking skills in math, but those are not the skills we focus on in this model. We're focused on the skills in this model that are making it hard for kids to respond to problems and frustrations adaptively. So one of those kids is sitting there very calmly. They're both struggling with the exact same math task. One of them is very calmly raising their hand and saying, um, can I get some help over here? The other is losing their mind. What's the difference between those two kids? One has skills that the other is lacking. There's your five big paradigm shifting themes. Um, for many people, those are a very big shift. I've had good colleagues of mine say to me, Ross, when I heard you covering those paradigm shifts, my back stiffened up, but I'm glad I kept listening. I hope you're still listening. Let's keep going. Very quickly, just to make sure a lot of these points are solid. What's the limitations? What are the limitations of approaches aimed at simply modifying behavior? 
rewards and punishments solve no problems and enhance no skills. I was doing a talk for an organization in California about two or three months ago, and a lot of the people were putting comments in the chat box, but Ross, aren't you aware, who could, who could not be aware, by the way, that the reward and punishment approach has a lot of research backing it? I'm aware. That's how I was trained. And I'm aware that that research tells us that rewarding and punishing is effective at modifying behavior. The problem is that rewarding and punishing solves none of the problems that are causing those behaviors. And we can no longer be satisfied with merely improving a kid's behavior if the problems that are causing those behaviors remain unsolved. It's not enough. Not only that, rewarding and punishing can be distracting, it can cause us to focus on signals rather than on the problems that are causing those signals. As I'm sure you all know, there is significant disproportionality in the ways in which rewards and punishments are administered, particularly in American public schools, especially punishments. Uh, statement of the hopefully obvious, we are punishing black and brown kids um, greatly out of proportion to their numbers. And a lot of people have been focused on trying to do something about that. And a lot of that work has been focused on equity and social justice, and that is very important work to be doing. It's also gonna take a while. And um, while I think that is very important work to be doing, I'm not that patient when it comes to how we're treating our kids. There wouldn't be disproportionality if we weren't using punitive, exclusionary, disciplinary practices in the first place. And what we are finding is that when you implement collaborative and proactive solutions in a school, within about a year and a half or two, you are no longer relying on punitive, exclusionary, disciplinary practices, which are good for no one, but you have just simultaneously gotten rid of your disproportionality problem. If you're gonna be disproportional, better to be disproportional in solving problems with kids than, than in administering detention, suspension, expulsion, corporal punishment, restraint, seclusion, arrests. The other work is crucial, but I'm not that patient. All right, let's get a little technical in the last half hour that I'm gonna be presenting here. What are the two most important roles that a potential helper can play in the life of a kid with concerning behaviors? And I'm operating on the assumption that everybody watching this right now is in one of the helping professions. Um, that's because parenting is one of the helping professions. Uh, education is one of the helping professions. Mental health is one of the helping professions. Medical doctors are in one of the helping professions. This is not on the slide, but I should tell you the two key criteria for being a good helper. Number one, helpers help. Helpers do not make things worse. Helpers like medical doctors abide by the Hippocratic Oath, which goes something like this. Don't make it worse. I find that a lot of the things we are doing to kids with concerning behaviors makes things worse. And that's not helping. Uh, criteria number two, helpers have thick skin. While helpers are of course entitled to their feelings, helpers bend over backwards to make sure that those feelings do not interfere with helping. What are the two key roles a helper can play in the life of a kid who's struggling? Whether the kid is communicating that they are struggling in ways that are lucky or unlucky, your roles are the same. First, figure out what that kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems are using 
the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. Uh, that's what makes concerning behavior highly predictable. That's what helps us be proactive. That's what helps us move away from what people would call perpetual survival mode or walking on eggshells to proactively and systematically and finally solving the problems that are causing the behaviors that are causing them to feel like they are in perpetual survival mode or walking on eggshells. I'm gonna show you the ALSIP on the next slide. I'm not gonna teach you how to use it, but there's that 35 minute video on the Lives in the Balance website to teach you how to do that and a video showing you how it is used. Uh, role number two, start solving those problems, but do it in a way collaboratively and proactively that has you and the kid being partners with each other. This is not adversarial. This is not enemies and it never needed to be. When you're solving problems collaboratively and proactively with kids, you are engaging kids in solving the problems that affect their lives. I'm always asking the question, why would you wanna leave the kid out of the loop on that? When you're solving problems collaboratively and proactively, you and the kid are together coming up with solutions that tend to be a whole lot more durable and a whole lot more effective because you're not flying solo. And best of all, what some research is starting to tell us is that when you are solving problems collaboratively and proactively, through the sheer process of solving problems, you are simultaneously enhancing the skills the kid was lacking. So in other words, you're not just solving problems. You are not just therefore improving the kid's behavior. You're not just improving communication. You're not just improving your relationship with the kid. You are simultaneously enhancing the skills the kid is lacking through the mere process of solving problems collaboratively and proactively. All right, very quickly, here it is. The Assessment of Lagging Skills and Unsolved Problems. The newest rendition is called the ALSEP 2020. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about it because you are gonna learn much more about it on the Lives in the Balance website. And by the way, those videos of how to use the ALSEP and seeing it being used are in the guided tour on the Lives in the Balance website. There's a search bar on the website, just type in guided tour and you will find it. All kinds of streaming video. Um, to take you further than where I'm going to get you to by the time I'm through speaking here. Lagging skills in the top section, unsolved problems in the bottom section. You're checking off the lagging skills that seem to apply to this kid. You are writing or typing in, uh, the ALSIP is available, I might have already said this, in an editable fillable format on the Lives in the Balance website so that you can type instead of write and save and share electronically. Lagging skills are for lenses. Checking off lagging skills helps people come to the recognition this kid is lacking skills, not motivation. Unsolved problems, once again, are the expectations the kid is having difficulty reliably meeting. There are prompts to help you identify those unsolved problems. There are prompts for schools and facilities, and there are prompts for homes and clinics. Use the prompts, the goal is to identify all of the expectations that a kid is having difficulty reliably meeting. You will learn how on the Lives in the Balance website. There is some chance that the kid is going to have a very large number of unsolved problems. Thankfully, you're not gonna be solving all of them at once. This kid could have 30, 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems. Those problems do tend to accumulate when they go unsolved. We're gonna be talking about prioritizing on the next slide because you're not gonna be able to solve all of those problems at once. You're gonna to have to prioritize. But before then, here's what we hope happens in an ALSA meeting. 
we hope people say, wow. We hope light bulbs go on. As in, wow, this kid really is lacking a lot of skills. That is a beautiful wow moment, especially when it is uttered from the lips of somebody who wasn't thinking that when they walked into the meeting. The also changes lenses. Wow. No wonder what we've been doing hadn't been working. That is a beautiful wow moment, especially when it is uttered from the lips of someone who came into the meeting thinking we should just keep doing what hadn't been working for the last three years. Maybe it'll take. The also changes lenses. Maybe what you've been doing for the last three years isn't what the kid needed. Maybe that's why it's not working. This next one often comes with a rather shaken up look attached. Wow, I'm kind of feeling bad about how I've been treating him. Now, what's that person all shook up about? Well, they are now simultaneously reflecting on what they now know about the kid and how they've been treating the kid and coming to the recognition that the two do not square up. That'll shake you up. More wow moments. So you're saying this kid only gets upset when these unsolved problems pop up? That's right. And you're saying these unsolved problems don't pop up. We know they're coming. That's right. Any unsolved problem you've written in on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is by definition predictable, or you wouldn't have been able to write them in. And you're saying that if we solve these problems with this kid, the kid won't get upset over them anymore? Well, that's right. It's only unsolved problems that cause concerning behaviors. Solved problems don't. And you're saying we can solve these problems proactively because there are very few surprises left. That's right. Lagging skills and unsolved problems are the information that's been missing. Lagging skills and unsolved problems change people's lenses. So I was speaking at an autism conference in Denmark pre-pandemic, so maybe two, two and a half, three years ago. And a mom in my audience raised her hand and very tentatively said, but I found my daughter's autism diagnosis to be very helpful. I said, that's good. But she then pondered it a little bit further and she said, but what you're saying is that her autism diagnosis didn't tell me about her specific lagging skills and unsolved problems. I said, right. She then pondered it a little bit further and said, and I think what you're saying is that once I figure out my daughter's lagging skills and unsolved problems, I'm going to discover that her autism diagnosis wasn't telling me all that much. I said, probably. Now let's talk about prioritizing. If this kid has 30, 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems, you cannot solve them all at once. And if you try to solve them all at once, you'll end up solving none of them at all. So you got to prioritize. You will never be working on more than three unsolved problems at any particular given point in time with this kid. Which three? Here's the algorithm. Safety first. Any unsolved problem setting in motion safety issues is a high priority. Safety is a big deal. If there are no safety issues, we're either going with frequency, the unsolved problems that are setting in motion concerning behaviors most often, or gravity the unsolved problems that are having the greatest negative impact on this kid's life or the lives of others. You get to pick three that you're working on with the kid right now. Three problems that you are going to be trying to solve with this kid right now. How are you keeping track with the problem solving plan? Also available on the Lives in the Balance website, also free also available in an editable fillable format. What you're seeing here are three columns, each representing a distinct unsolved problem. Um, there's room for three. Top box, what is the unsolved problem? So this is how we're keeping track. 
both of what we're working on right now with this kid, the problems we're trying to solve, and also what we're not working on right now with this kid, the problems that have been removed. Next box, crucial. Who is going to take primary responsibility for solving that problem with that kid? We gotta designate somebody. But designating somebody shouldn't be very hard because the ideal person to be solving the problem with the kid is the person whose expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. In schools, that's not the principal. That's not the assistant principal. That's not the school psychologist, school counselor, school social worker. That's probably the classroom teacher or the specialist. And now an interesting question is popping up among people who are in those positions. When does he think we're gonna do that? Well, one of the things I and my colleagues at Lives in the Balance help a lot of schools and facilities and parents do is find the time. Let me be more explicit. Find the time to solve problems with kids. And in every school and facility and home, there's buried time, time that we didn't realize was there, that, and time that we could use if we were committed to solving problems with kids. We also help a lot of schools and facilities create coverage systems so that when someone is free in the building, and there's almost always somebody free, they can cover the classroom of someone who badly needs to solve a problem with a kid. And now you understand why the CPS model has quite the track record for dramatically reducing or eliminating discipline referrals, detention, suspension, restraint, seclusion. You don't need discipline referrals anymore. You're not sending kids to the office to get punished anymore. You might need a problem solving referral to let the office know that you need coverage to solve problems with a kid. The remaining boxes on the problem solving plan walk us through the three steps that are involved in solving a problem collaboratively. Once the problem is solved, it comes off the problem solving plan and another one arrives from the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems to take its place. This is how we're keeping track. This is how we're keeping it organized. This is how we're making it systematic. This is how we are keeping kids and problems from slipping through the cracks. Two sheets, both free. And by the way, if you think that solving problems with kids is going to take a lot of time, think about how much time you're spending on this kid with the problems still unsolved. One of the things people say about this model, everybody's worried about time in the beginning. Three months in, what are people saying instead? This model saves time. All right, I haven't covered what plan B is yet, so I'm slightly speaking language that you may not understand, but there's plan B. The last thing I'm gonna cover here are your options for solving problems with kids. You have three of them in the real world. In this model, you're only using two of them. The three options are called plan A, plan B, and plan C. Uh, you're only using B and C in this model. A is only up there because at least, at least at this point in human evolution, it's still popular but you're almost never using plan A when you're using this model. What I've done here is I've taken the many different ways in which adults solve problems with kids, and I've reduced them to three basic options, A, B, C. Very nice shorthand for thinking about how you wanna deal with problems with kids. Notice unsolved is underlined at the top. A problem isn't unsolved, you don't need one of these plans. It's a met expectation. So for example, if a kid is brushing their teeth as well and as often as you'd like them to before going to bed at night, you don't need a plan. It's not an unsolved problem. It's a met expectation, no plan needed. If a kid is doing their homework as well and as often as we'd like them to, you don't need a plan. 
It's not an unsolved problem. It's a met expectation, no plan needed. But if there's any expectation a kid is having difficulty meeting reliably, you need a plan. And in this model, you're either going with plan B or plan C. Let's start with plan C. Plan C is pretty important. It's where you are setting the problem aside, at least for now. Um, now, many people quickly think, because they're listening to me with a certain filter on, giving in, no, there's no such thing as giving in this entire model. Giving up, no giving up in the entire model. Prioritizing, there is prioritizing in this model. Plan C is what you're doing with the unsolved problems you have consciously, deliberately, and proactively decided. We're not working on that one right now. We got bigger fish to fry. Plan C is important for another reason. I find that a lot of concerning behaviors are caused and a lot of punitive exclusionary discipline delivered because of expectations we already know the kid can't meet. So what we're doing in this model is very deliberately asking the question, this expectation that the kid is having difficulty meeting, can they meet this expectation? Is this expectation even in range, a very important thing for us caregivers to be contemplating, because if the expectation isn't even in range for this kid, then why do we have this expectation for this kid? One of my favorite expressions when I'm working with school staff and staff and facilities when we're trying to help them get rid of restraint and seclusion is, I hate seeing kids get restrained and secluded over expectations we already know the kid can't meet. Uh, that leaves us with only two other plans. Oh, by the way, has the expectation been removed forever? No. For now. When will we get back to it? When we get some of our higher priority unsolved problems solved. Now, one of the things I will say about plan C, a lot of adults get a little queasy about removing expectations, even temporarily. Let me help you feel better about that. The kid isn't meeting the expectation anyway. The kid isn't meeting the expectation anyway. So now you got two choices. You can continue to put the expectation on the kid, have the kid exhibit concerning behaviors and all that goes along with it, or make it official. We don't even expect the kid to meet that expectation right now. That's plan C. That leaves us with only two other plans, A and B, both represent a way to solve a problem with a kid. There's just one massive difference between them. With plan A, you're solving the problem unilaterally. With plan B, you're solving the problem collaboratively. You know which plan you're using in this model, but does that mean we are allergic to plan A? No, not allergic. We just don't think it's a very good idea. But if a kid is about to dart in front of a speeding car in a parking lot, you're not doing plan C. You're not saying, you know what? We've got bigger fish to fry here. So you're too late for plan B. You're doing plan A. You yank on the kid's arm. You save the kid's life. If the kid loses it, so be it. But if three weeks later, the kid has now darted in front of a speeding car in a parking lot 17 additional times, and you've yanked 17 additional times. Yeah, yanking is working at saving the kid's life, but yanking is not working at solving this problem. You're gonna need another plan. And if you decide, this is not a high priority right now, we got bigger fish to fry, or I don't think this kid is even capable of meeting this expectation. At this point in this kid's development, and I've worked with kids who are not yet capable of remaining safe in a parking lot. You're gonna do plan C. And if you decide this is a high priority right now and we cannot just avoid parking lots forever and this kid is capable with a little help of meeting this expectation right now, 
you're going to do plan B. See, see, the problem with plan A isn't that we adults occasionally use it. It's that we use it a lot and we stick with it, even when it's clearly not working. All right. Let's see what I got for you next. Possibly the last thing we're going to cover. I'm not sure what other goodies I have for you in my slides, but here we go. How do you solve a problem collaboratively? Well, three steps. And it's the same three steps, whether it's taking place in a home or in a school or in a prison or in an inpatient psychiatry unit or in a residential facility. It's the same three steps, whether you're doing this with a three-year-old. You can do this with a three-year-old, of course. 12-year-old, a speaking kid, a non-speaking kid, 97-year-old, three steps. The first step is called the empathy step. It's where you're gathering information from the kid about what's making it hard for the kid to meet a particular expectation. As I'm always saying, kids have information we badly need. Information we think we already know. We adults are famous for thinking, we already know what's getting in the kid's way. What's the point in asking? Um, as I'm always telling caregivers, it's not your job to know what's getting in the kid's way. It's your job to know how to find out. And where are you finding out? In the empathy step. And we don't have time in this um, venue, but there are a ton of strategies aimed at helping you find out. That's the empathy step. It's where the kid's voice is heard. It's where the kid has agency. Both good things. It's where we adults finally find out what's been making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation. So true story, I was doing a podcast with a father who does father podcasts, I don't know how long ago, a year and a half or two ago. And he was telling me about his three-year-old daughter who was having, here's the unsolved problem, difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night. He was telling me he was sure he knew what was making it hard for her to brush her teeth before going to bed at night. He was sure it was the taste of the toothpaste. So he's telling me eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste later, he still she's still having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. So he tells me he finally did the empathy step of plan B. I'm thinking, and people think plan B takes more time. Plan B saves time. When he did the empathy step with his daughter, and it sounds like this, I've noticed you've been having difficulty brushing your teeth before you go to bed at night. What's up? What did he learn? That when he was using the electric toothbrush on her to brush her teeth, it was getting water all over her face and she hated it. I said to him, well, now there's a concern eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste would never address. The define it all concern step. This is where we adults are entering our concern into consideration on the same unsolved problem. We adults frequently have important concerns as well. Regrettably, we often try to get those concerns addressed through use of plan A. Now you're trying to get that exact same concern addressed through use of plan B. Same concern, completely different approach to getting it addressed. The hard the hardest part of this step is the fact that we adults frequently don't have the slightest idea what our concerns are. That's because we've already moved on to our solutions, which we are often busy imposing. Um, but to make this step easier, there are basically just two categories of adult concerns. How the unsolved problems affecting the kid, health, safety, learning, how the unsolved problems affecting other people, health, safety, learning. What was the father's concern? He said, well, the thing is, and by the way, the, th the reason you're starting with the thing is, or my concern is, is because you want to start the define it all concern step with words that let the kid know that their concerns are not about to be dismissed or disregarded. The thing is, 
if you don't brush your teeth before you go to bed at night, then the bacteria that's accumulated on your teeth all day is gonna sit on your teeth and it could cause cavities. And it hurts a lot to have cavities filled, how the unsolved problems affecting the kid. And I'd rather not have to spend the money if I don't have to, how the unsolved problem is affecting others. We now have two sets of concerns on the table. We are ready for the invitation. The invitation begins with the words, I wonder if there's a way. Now, what are you wondering if there's a way to do? You're wondering if there's a way to solve this problem. And you could say it that way. You could say, I wonder if there's a way to solve this problem. But if you say it that way, a lot of kids are gonna look at you and say, what problem? So what you wanna do instead is recap or restate the concerns of both parties. Generically, it would sound like this. Then I'll give you this specific example in the toothbrushing example. I wonder if there's a way for us to do something about ba 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 one party's concerns, and also do something about ba 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 the other party's concerns. You are then giving the kid the first crack at the solution. You got any ideas? Usually they do. If they don't, I bet you do. It's not the kid's job to solve the problem. It's y'all's job to solve the problem. Y'all are partners, y'all are teammates. What would that have sounded like in the example that I'm using with the three-year-old? Wonder if there's a way for us to do something about the water getting all over your face when I'm brushing your teeth with the electric toothbrush. And also make sure that the bacteria don't sit on your teeth all night so you don't get cavities so it doesn't hurt to get them filled and so that I don't have to spend the money. You got any ideas? The kid did, they usually do. The kid said, could we wrap a towel around my face when you're brushing my teeth with the electric toothbrush so that my face doesn't get wet and so that I don't get cavities? Who won? Both. Who lost? Nobody whose authority was undermined, nobody. You are very much the authority figure when you're using plan B, a whole lot more of an authority figure than you would have been if you were busy putting expectations on kids you already knew they couldn't meet and a whole lot more of an authority figure than you would have been if you were thinking that rewards and punishments would solve any of the problems that are affecting kids' lives. I seem to have landed this plane right on time. Uh, let's see if there's any questions. Here are the websites that will take you further. The Lives in the Balance website, of course, is where all the free resources are. CPS Connection is where you can find some additional trainings. The Kids We Lose is the website for the documentary film I mentioned earlier. And the truecrisisprevention.org website is from Lives in the Balance, but it contains all kinds of free resources to help schools and facilities end their use of restraint and seclusion. Let me just put a pitch in for one other thing. It's free. Lives in the Balance sponsors a children's mental health conference every year. This year it's in October. This year, the children's mental health conference, we are teaming up with the American Psychological Association, the National Initiative to End Corporal Punishment, the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates, and the Alliance to End Seclusion and Restraint to focus on two key pieces of federal legislation the Keeping All Students Safe Act, and the Protecting Our Students in Schools Act, both of which could pass this year if we can help our legislators appreciate why they are so crucial for our kids. Uh, so on the Lives in the Balance website in the workshops and training section, if you search it, you'll find the Children's Mental Health Conference. Uh, if you can, come. If you can't show up on the day of the conference, your um, free ticket gives you access to the recording. Jen? Wow, that's wonderful. 
What you, questions do we have? Let's see here. I actually have a few of my own. So everyone else, please ask your questions if you have any. Um, if I actually would love if you could start. So one of our previous guests, um, Dr. Clarissa Kripke, had said something that, that was so brilliant, but such a simple fact to point out is that challenging behavior is a caregiver complaint. And so like in making this lens shift, um, you also had switched from using the term challenging behavior to concerning behavior, which is again, like a, just another more respectful and helpful way to explain what's actually happening. So could you just tell us why you made that shift? Well, I made that shift because the research has been telling us for a while that whether a kid, whether a kid's concerning behavior is lucky or unlucky, internalizing or externalizing, flight versus fight, the behavior is being caused by the same lagging skills. Challenging behavior tends to cause people to think of unlucky behavior. Mm -hmm. Concerning behavior levels the playing field. That's why I made the switch. This applies to kids who, whose way of communicating that they're having difficulty meeting certain expectations is lucky as well. Yeah, yeah. And again, the framing does matter so much. And it matters a lot. Uh, even like I was thinking about how IEP goals are written just generally in the public education system. And the emphasis is always on what the student will do. And I know that I was personally taken aback by how things are written when I first, you know, had my kids enter the system. And part of what always bothered me was even if even if you have accommodations, you know, written in that first section of an IEP, when goals are written that the child will perform certain goals, it sort of implies that there's going to be a compliance aspect to meeting those Correct. goals if it's Correct. not described properly. Um, and like, you know, I've seen goals where it's like, um, you know, X uh, will transition from a non-preferred activity to a preferred activity with no tantrums, crying, or whatever else. And so like one of, like one of the obvious problems to me with that is that a, you're not saying like how you're going to be helping them decrease their stress, which is likely part of the problem, at least in that scenario. Um, but also it's, it's implying that as long as they don't display the stress, then the goal has been met. Mm -hmm. But really that's not what we should be focusing on, right? That's correct. And there is a CPS flavored IEP on the Lives in the Balance website. There is also a CPS flavored functional behavior assessment on the Lives in the Balance website so that people can see how these things can be written so that they actually give us meaningful information and point us in the right direction. Yeah. And do you, so I guess like a follow-up to that is these things can be very, um, sensitive when say that, say that the parent wants to address these things with their school team and they would like for the goals to be written in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have so that it doesn't come off as, you know, you're not questioning the professionals, but you do want it you do want things to be written in a way that are respectful and actually going to help the child well the first thing i would say is it's important to remember that you are part of the team mm -hmm. if you are a parent you are part of the team if you're not good with the iep if you weren't instrumental in writing the iep you shouldn't sign it if you're not good with it you are part of the team but that's more legal. Um, what I always tell parents is find the person in the building who you think will be most empathic toward where you're coming from. Because everybody, every building is different and get that person's guidance on how to navigate the system in that building. 
Some schools are going to be very uh, open to parental input, and some schools aren't. So I don't want to characterize all schools and all school personnel as closed-minded. It's just not true. Right. So it's good to know how to navigate that particular school and have somebody guiding you so that you're not feeling like you're out there in the woods all alone. Yeah, that's good advice. Stay collaborative um, for as long as you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you think of this, this model, even in terms of the adult, if the adults haven't been trained in this framework, then a lot of these ideas may be new to them as well. And Correct. And there's a good chance they will say, oh, yeah, Dr. Green's model, that's not evidence-based. Point them straight to the research page on the Lives in the Balance website, and they will learn that this model is evidence-based and see all of the research that supports it. Yes. And also, there is a lot of evidence that uh, rewards and consequences degrade extrinsic motivation and have other things that have not, you know, when we hear evidence-based, a lot of times it's just a tiny snapshot of something that was measured. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, effective or even helpful in plenty of other areas. So here's the interesting thing. There's, there's plenty of evidence-based models that could take you in completely different directions. Mm -hmm. I find that the rubber meets the road. The most important shift, because we don't want to sit around talking about this evidence base or that evidence base. It's going to go nowhere, yeah. right? Collaborative and proactive solutions is evidence-based. Rewards and punishments is evidence-based. That's Let's call that a level playing field. Um, do we really want to only focus on the kids concerning behaviors? Is that enough? Or do we want to focus on solving the problems that are causing the kids concerning behaviors? Rewards and punishments, despite the evidence base telling us that they improve behavior, rewards and punishments do not solve the problems that are causing that behavior. And as I said earlier, we can no longer be satisfied yeah. with merely improving kids' behavior even if there's an evidence base behind doing that. That's an evidence base saying the behavior changes, but it's not an evidence base telling us that rewarding and punishing solves the problems that are causing those behaviors. Now, who are we? What are we really about? What are we trying to accomplish here? Right, yeah, and that's the distinction we need to be thinking about. That's cr crucial. Yeah. Um, okay, question from Lee B. Do you have an example you can share of using the empathy slash collaborative model, uh, collaborative problem solving technique with a young child who has a communication disability? Well, depends on the communication. You're, you can find a website, you can find a video on the Lives and Balance website of me doing plan B with a kid who is very compromised in the expressive language realm in particular. His name is Joshua. He's the kid, he's the blonde kid in one of the videos that's on the website of Plan B being done. By the way, Joshua was also the inspiration for the film, The Kids We Lose. Because when I first met Joshua, one of his diagnoses was autism spectrum disorder. When I first met Joshua, I learned that he had been in a thera therapeutic school for kids on the autism spectrum for about three months. And I also learned that during those three months, Joshua had been restrained or placed in a locked or blocked door seclusion 120 times oh. in three months. He is the kid who finally got me to say, we have got to make this film. Mm -hmm. Making a film is not cheap. We have got to make this film. Um, Joshua, you'll see, is very hard to understand. His expressive language skills, I would peg at around a three or four-year-old level. But there we are doing plan B with him through the spoken word. He, was, he, was, he had enough there for us to do it through the spoken word. If a kid does not have enough spoken word to do it through the spoken word, then we're going to rely on any of many technologies, pictures, uh, hand signals, um, 
There's apps that can do this for you. Um, uh, Prolo Quota Go can do this for you. Um, it's not that kids who are non-speaking aren't communicating, as mm -hmm. I said earlier, it's they are not communicating through our preferred modality, but that does not mean that you cannot engage them in solving the problems that affect their lives. Um, Joshua is a good example of a kid who's compromised in the language processing communication realm, but can still participate in plan B through the spoken word. I am hoping to have new video of plan B being done with a non-speaking kid up on the website within the next month or two. Okay. Okay. That's great. And like you said, it's, it's really on us to figure out a way the child is communicating. So it's on us to figure out how to listen better and give them the, a variety of means with which to tell us. That's what. correct. And a, and a good speech and language pathologist can help because they find ways to communicate with kids who are non-speaking all the time. But the key ingredient here is creativity, knowing what's out there, means by which kids who are non-speaking do communicate about other things besides the problems that affect their lives. Whatever technology that is can just as easily be deployed to help kids participate in solving the problems that affect their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lee asked as a follow-up, and I don't know if you can, but can you mention what therapeutic school this was? What therapeutic school was what? That um, Joshua was. I will not do that. Okay. Yeah, I, that's fine. <laughs> um, okay. So we have a question from Dr. Elizabeth Torres, who's our director at the NJAs. Um, She said, do you know if schools have someone like a child neurologist on board to help provide information about conditions that involve dysregulated nervous systems? Because I know we have found that that is also a huge barrier. Uh, schools get very little training on the nervous systems or you know any of the brain science that we have learned over the last few decades. So here's the deal. I think it's great to have, you know, we only have so much time we can only train people in so many things. Mm -hmm. I love, and there's a lot of this training going on. If you're getting trained in trauma responsive care, you are getting trained on brain. So it's, mm -hmm. um, and brain functioning. There's a lot of trauma responsive training going on these days. The million dollar question I'm always asking is, where do we want to put most of our time? I think it's great for people to know about brain functioning. But I think it's even more important for people to know what they can do. Because for me, at a very practical level, brain functioning is a wonderful thing to know. I've taken a lot of coursework on it. But in the final analysis, what do I really want to know? What are this kid's lagging skills? In the final analysis, what do I really want to know? What expectations is this kid having difficulty meeting? So the brain science helped us understand, and that's I draw a lot of. The information on lagging skills from brain science. Mm -hmm. Brain science helps us understand this is lagging skills. This is not lagging motivation. I rely very heavily on brain science for that. But I also find, believe it or not, that that is the lowest hurdle for helping people move in a different direction, if you can believe it. The shift in lens, not easy, but the easiest part helping people and schools and facilities change their practices, change what they're focused on, change their structures and their policies so they can focus on those things, that's my top priority. That said, I rely a lot on brain science for the lagging skill component of this model. I'm just always asking myself, what do we wanna spend the most time helping people learn about? For me, uh, the ALSIP, plan B. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so she also said, um, if improving the child's behavior, which is what behaviorist reward and punishment approaches are targeting, we know that that can cause trauma in a child because of genetic predispositions to PTSD. There's actually recent research about this um, 
as well. So how, how do we continue to push for this paradigm shift? Like we, so we have all of this available information. Schools are set up with the old paradigm. How, how do we make those initial? <laughs> I, I would be delighted. I do it through books and through webinars and through my website and through, not my website, the website of Lives in the Balance, uh, the advocacy efforts of Lives in the Balance, the outreach efforts of Lives in the Balance. But here's the deal. If NJ Ace wants to collaborate with Lives in the Balance on getting this out there, believe me, that is a conversation that I would be delighted to have. I think we can make a big dent and get a lot more of this going on in New Jersey, as I, I know that New Jersey is what we might call a very behavioral state. Yes. New Jersey needs this. I am delighted to talk with you all about how to make this happen. That is a conversation I would love to participate in. Okay, that's very exciting. And <laughs> we will definitely talk more about that. Um, so maybe then that's a good segue to kind of leave this off is you, you mentioned, um, you know, the time that people think that these changes take and the money involved. And you have some statistics on your website. Let me just read a few of these numbers. There's $120,000 for the average annual cost per child of juvenile detention in the U.S. $85 billion spent annually on incarceration. 15,000 to 120,000 annual cost per child of placement outside their home school. There are huge sums of money being spent despite the so-called success of the paradigm that we have had in place for decades now. Um, so really this, what can we lose by trying, by trying something else that is based on what we know about human development at this point and also going to help kids. Many adults that we talk to as well talk about the trauma that the systems have done to them over the years. And so, so this is more cost effective. It takes, yes, it takes initial time, but this is, this is a model that if we just invest what we need to invest initially, it will cost less financially, physically, emotionally in the We long have term. to put that in front of our legislators. We have to put that in front of our policymakers. We need to keep doing what we're doing. I know that the autism community has a very loud voice and is very vocal about um, how we want kids to be treated and um, the impact of traditional ways of treating them uh, keep doing what you're doing. Don't shut up. Um, come to the Children's Mental Health Conference so you can learn how to advocate for those two bills. Um, let's join forces to make this stuff happen. I actually think that it's starting to become within the realm of possibility. The other thing I will say is what those numbers you gave prove to us is that kids concerning behavior is big business. Yeah. There's a lot of folks making a lot of money on teaching people how to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, the good news is uh, I don't receive a salary from Lives in the Balance. <laughs> uh, this is not a work of primarily oriented toward income for me. I've got to pay my mortgage. This is a work of passion. And I think that's the way it is for most folks. Yeah. So um, this shouldn't be big business. This should be about helping kids and paying attention to what we're spending on them doing things that clearly aren't working. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I am so grateful that you joined us today. Your model is amazing. We did post all of the links that you mentioned before Fabulous. in the chat. Um, we'll post them again in the video description when we're done as well. Um, anybody will be able, this will be open access. People can watch it as they want. Is, can you just remind me again, the link to the um, upcoming seminar that you have is it'll that be on the, it'll be on the lives in the balance website okay in the how about i show you <laughs> that's the easiest way okay 
just so that we can make sure we share that with people as well. Here's the Lives in the Balance website. It's brand new. We just switched away from our old website. Go to our solution. Go to workshops and trainings. By the way, the, the guided tour mm -hmm. is in these three sections. It's the same tour. Parents and families, educators and schools, pediatricians and family physicians, people will find it easily. Here's workshops and trainings. You'll have to scroll down a little bit past our trainings on collaborative and proactive solutions and right Friday, October 20th. here our training options. There's our annual summit, but there is our 2021 children's mental health conference okay. Friday, October 8th. You register right there. There is no charge to attend and we will be having um, comments both from Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut and mm -hmm. Representative Don McEachin from Virginia, two proponents of those two bills, as well as all kinds of speakers telling us about the research on restraining and secluding and hitting kids and how to advocate on behalf of these two bills. That's so wonderful. So we're gonna put that link in this chat as well. Um, we'll share it. We hope as many people can join as possible. I know I will be. Um, and thank you so much for your work and your passion and your advocacy for kids. And please keep doing what you're doing. And I, I don't plan to stop. Uh, I will draw. I will. I won't stop until I drop. Um, but I'm looking forward to our next conversation so that we can think about how to team up here. Yes, me as well. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for joining us.